I thought I would first update you on the plan. As I said, this talk is going to include a lot of bits of work that are not my work. It's going to include a lot of examples and not a lot of technical content because I don't think evening is a time for technical content. Um, I'm planning to talk about examples of networks that are relevant to epidemiology and examples of, of networks tripping me up and confounding my attempts to understand what's going on. That's near the end, so we can finish on that note. Um, examples of the sort of things we might want to compute or measure with respect to networks and disease. Uh, and along the way, we're going to see some examples of some complex features that these networks can have. Space, time, uh, dy dynamics, character, this, this sort of thing. Uh, I wanted, to, I put it in small writing here, Probably everybody's terribly tired of COVID-19, uh, but you can't really have a network epidemiology talk or an epidemiology talk at all these days uh, without some COVID involved. Um, so there are going to be COVID-19 related examples. Sorry. All right. Uh, so let's, I guess, start with a discussion of what I mean by network or graph. So my PhD work was in graph theory, and I would never have called it a network. Uh, until I started doing a postdoc in an applied area and um, got the impression that sort of the more applied you are, the more likely you are to call it a network, rather than the more combinatorial you are, the more likely you are to call it a graph. And, and there are some things at either end that are clearly one but not the other, but yeah, I live mostly in the middle, right? So my graphs often have time attached to them or, or something, um, some data hiding in them. And that, for many people, would make them a network. But what I ultimately mean really is I mean a set of dots or nodes or vertices connected by lines or edges. So here's a fine example. I think you can see here we have some dots, some big red dots, some little red dots uh, connected to the other dots with little lines. Now what this particular network is, uh, you might recognize it if you've seen a lot of network science talks. Um, this is a sexual contact network and a lot of early network epidemiology was really um, I guess, pioneered uh, related to, to sexually transmitted infections, right? Um, because sexual, uh, sexual contact networks have a lot of really interesting properties, right? Um, so one of them is that people or little nodes are really uneven in their contacts, right? So one of the reasons that some of these nodes are much bigger than the others is like, look at this one here. If you can see, uh, if you can see my cursor, fantastic. If not, I'm pointing at one of the larger red dots. You can see that the larger red ones have a lot more connections than the little red ones, which have far fewer. Um, so there's kind of this interesting topological structure, uh, but there's also different importances. Um, that's gonna, I'm gonna reuse this example network a couple of times in this talk uh, to, to uh, bring up a couple, a couple kind of important concepts. Okay, but what I really mean is, yeah, a set of dots connected by lines. Now, sometimes I might want my, uh, my dots to be in layers, um, what do I mean by that? Um, I've, I've thrown up a figure here in the in the top left. For those of you who are already uh, network layer enthusiasts, uh, if you already are, I mean A. But if you've not seen this figure before, then completely ignore it, please, and look at the examples. What I mean are things where we might have contact between entities. So we have, have edges connecting our nodes, but that the edges have sort of fundamentally different characteristics in a way that makes them useful to consider separately. So um, for example, uh, we might look at the network down here in the sort of middle bottom, the network here of all cattle movements. These are cattle movements in Scotland from, I don't remember, 2011 or something, a good long time ago. And each dot, and I realize they're so small, there are so many that you can't really see them. Each dot is a farm, and a line between two farms mean that there were some cattle traded between them. Um, so we might have uh, one layer or, or um, qualitative type of connection that is cattle trades, and then have another qualitative type of connection uh, that is pig trades. Because, I mean, you don't get a lot of farms with both pigs and cows, but you get a few. And if instead your nodes were regions or parishes or something, then you'd have a lot of parishes that have both pigs and cows in them. And if you're trying to think about the spread of a disease like foot and mouth disease, the different shapes of these networks can be really important. Right, because you're you're kind of all you can really see in this cattle network is that it's a big complicated mess, and that's a good summary of the cattle trading system. Really, if you draw it all at once, it's a really big complicated mess. There's a lot going on, whereas pig trading networks are much more simple. They tend to look a bit like pyramids. You have some places that make pigs, and then places that grow them, and then places that grow them a bit more, and that's that's kind of it. They tend to be directed one way, um, 
you know, if you take only those movements, it's, it's much simpler. Putting these two things together, of course, get really complicated. But those are both trades. You might have other kinds of contacts. So I've drawn like a, a tiny little map up here of Scotland of all of the, um, I actually don't recall what these are, probably parishes, but I'm, I, I don't remember. Um, could be MSOAs or something, some small geographic unit. Uh, and, and we know which ones physically adjoin which other ones and therefore might have people or cattle or whatever kind of coming up and saying hello across the fence. Um, or you might have wind that you're worried about if you're thinking about a vector-borne disease. So, so something that, that midges spread or mosquitoes, wind can be important. Or you can have uh, wildlife reservoirs, I've indicated here with, with this animal, um, where you have less control uh, kind of, and less understanding perhaps of the network that's happening, but you know that it's sort of geographically constrained, right? You don't tend to get teleporting badgers. They mostly move across the surface of the earth in a, in a reasonably, um, reasonably constrained way. Okay, so my, my nodes might have, diff or, or my edges might have different qualities that I wanna consider separately. Uh, another thing that my edges might have, uh, they might have uh, times or qualities, um, that are, uh, that are dynamic. Um, so I've, I've put an example here. We've gone back to the cattle graphs again. Uh, I, I, until COVID happened, most of my epidemiology was cows. Ah, I yearn for the day that I can return to thinking about tuberculosis or foot and mouth or, or, or something else. Anyway, uh, one of the pieces of information we have about the cattle trading network is exactly on what days different trades happen. So I've put some entirely fictional schematic movements here. Uh, we might know that we have our different farms from one through four, a slaughterhouse down here. And we might know that this animal in black animal A is born onto this farm on January 1st. And then they're not labeled here, but we would know first of all, the directions which are indicated, but we would also know the dates of these movements. So we might know that this animal goes from here to here on the 1st of January, and then from here to here in March of next year or whatever. So they're temporally explicit. Um, and I, I wanna talk uh, if, we, if we have time, a little bit more about time and scale will we'll come up again later. All right, so those are some networks. They might have time, they might have direction. Um, I wanted to make a note that of course, we are all now extremely aware that humans move too. Um, and humans move in networks that can spread disease. Uh, this is sort of a, a whimsically chosen example of an air, airplane network, but there are many available, right? Where we have our nodes, instead of being farms or people, our um, cities or regions, and we connect them uh, based, on, uh, based on flights between them. Okay, so <clears throat> a lot of pictures of networks, uh, but what I'm ultimately talking about really <laughs> agents, dots, node, vertices, whatever, that can catch some sort of contagion because we're talking about disease here. And we have lines, which are contacts that can spread that contagion over the line. Perhaps they only spread it at some particular time. Perhaps they only spread it in one direction. But that's what these lines do. They spread disease. Okay. Um, so here's a, a simple example of the simplest possible contagion process on this example graph, uh, where we just have a graph or a network we have a contagion in red that starts in this upper left corner. And then if the thing spreads perfectly over the network, then at the next time, look, the contagion in red has spread to all of the original neighbors of where the thing was. And then one more time spread, step, it's spread one distance further. And then uh, at the end, everybody, uh, everybody in this network is infected. Of course, this isn't an especially reasonable model or realistic of most diseases. Most things don't spread perfectly over every contact. Uh, and you need to get a lot more complicated, but ultimately at the core of it, that's what we're talking about here. Something that is spreading between these, these vertices along these edges. All right. So the, the first thing I wanted to do that's probably unnecessary um, is to convince you that we have evidence that networks that we know about do spread disease. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and I've, I've got a couple examples I'm going to show here. One from veterinary epidemiology that's a bit older and then, and then one from human epidemiology. Um, and, and this first one is, uh, is the foot and mouth disease outbreak in 2001, uh, which some of you will remember. Uh, many of you won't. So I remember when I was, um, I was working uh, out near the, the vet school uh, at Edinburgh, somebody had mentioned that 
they'd gone and, and given one of their undergrad lectures and, and sort of mentioned the 2001 FMD outbreak, foot and mouth outbreak, which, you know, previously everyone, you would mention it and, and they would know, they would remember what it was. It was on the news. There were these horrible pictures of burning cattle. Uh, and they'd realized this year that um, almost all their students were born after the FMD, you know, the, <laughs> that, that they would now had students who, of course, didn't remember the FMD outbreak because because uh, they were born after it, which is, I suppose, one of those things that makes you feel a bit old. Um, but anyhow, uh, kind of during and after the fact, there was substantial analysis uh, of, of cases in that outbreak. Uh, and I've, I've plucked a picture from this particular paper. So this is, uh, again, a bit of work that I had nothing to do with. Um, uh, and, and kind of, it's a bit hard to see because the resolution is a little bit low, but even, even sort of when things were, were still 2001 and people were doing rapid analysis of these things, they could see and trace through careful uh, kind of contagion and, and movement tracing the spread of this virus around the country based on movements of, of sheep and cattle. So they note here that in this figure, here we have the, um, the original infection, that's this red dot, and they were able to map um, a trade uh, to Longtown Market, and which is this blue triangle, uh, and then from there uh, onto kind of onto other parts of the country, and then and then from there we see that uh, that spread over the trade network, and then subsequently local spread just from farm to farm to farm. Okay, so um, and there've been a, several papers uh, analyzing uh, that FMD outbreak and others uh, with respect to animal movements, and we have really good. Um, Apart from having good mathematical evidence, common sense will tell you that if you are moving sheep around and sheep are infected, then that's going to move your disease as well. Okay. Uh, the second piece of evidence I wanted to show you is also from uh, another nice paper that I uh, have absolutely nothing to do with other than enjoying it. Uh, and that's this paper by Brockman and Helbing. Um, I have included here a, a link to some of the videos associated with this publication. Essentially, um, while there's a lot going on in this figure, I'm going to talk you through just some parts of it. Um, they made the observation, which, uh, when you say it out loud, seems really obvious. <laughs> um, I remember being at a, a talk about this at a conference and thinking, well, of course, um, and thinking, well, why hadn't anybody, yeah, of course you would say that. Why hasn't anybody said that before? But some of the best new bits of work are always sort of like that, right? You hear them and think, oh, isn't that obvious? Um, but, uh, but no one had, had said it or proved it or, or done it before. All right, um, and so let me describe to you what these, these sort of radial pictures up here are. One of the things they observed in this paper is that um, if you try and look at the spread of a, um, a disease like, uh, like the first SARS or H1N1, which is swine flu uh, around the world, and here's kind of almost like uh, time caps of it. If you kind of try and watch this going from this world map to this world map to this world map to this, you can see the picture getting redder, but you don't obviously see waves of contagion going around the world like you would have done if you could have made this picture for say the Black Death. And the reason for that is that the Black Death moved at the speed of human feet, essentially, in waves across the world. Whereas what we have now, um, ultimately is disease spreading via airplane networks. And so these radial pictures up here are the same disease locations that are plotted on the world map, but instead are plotted on the airplane network. And, and on that, you can really clearly see uh, disease starting out near this, this central point where the disease started and then moving outwards and outwards and outwards in a ring. Now, this map and this ring are a simulation. So they've designed it to show this. So, you, you know, some, some caveats there, but it, it shows what they're proposing really nicely. And then when they compare the effective distance, by which they mean sort of airplane plus other transport distance, to the number of days that it take, took for uh, real diseases like swine flu or SARS to arrive in their locations, it, it maps up really well, right? Like that's a really sort of classic undergrad teaching correlation. That for SARS 2003, which started in China, um, you know, the states is really effectively close and it arrived there really quickly and then Hong Kong and Singapore and yeah so forth whereas the places that were farther away effectively it took longer to reach them. Same thing in the swine flu pandemic uh, st assuming a start in Mexico you see it hitting the states first and then moving outwards over the world. So when you consider uh, these big human pandemics 
um, on this airline network, you, you can really see a clear relationship there. Now, I would conjecture that if someone did this <laughs> with our current pandemic, you would probably see something similar. Uh, but I, I haven't seen this particular picture made yet for this pandemic. All right, so hopefully you believe me uh, that networks can spread disease. I suspect you already did, uh, but I have had to argue that in, in previous years with other audiences. Okie dokie. So given we know, that we know that our disease, uh, if we have a disease in mind, might be driven by a network, we really need to understand which network is driving it. Um, and I wanna show you a couple examples of different networks that could be contributing in different situations. So um, I'll, I'll start with COVID-19. Uh, and what I want to first argue is that networks that seem at first like they are quite similar in character actually look different in sometimes important ways. OK, um, so the first thing uh, is, is this notion of travel to work. So census data, uh, and here I'm going to talk about the 2011 census, which is the most recent one in, in the UK. Um, there's data gathered uh, for people down to quite, quite um, specific geographic areas that ask them, where is your primary residence and where do you work? Um, so we've been calling this informally commute data. We don't know that it suggests someone commutes between those locations daily, but we kind of treat it that way when we're doing modeling. So it would sound like all of the data in that data set is, is pretty similar and we could just use it as, a, as the basis of a COVID model. Um, but one thing I, I observed um, early on in the pandemic when I was kind of wrangling these networks and figuring out how and what to move them is that if you slice them by different industries, they actually look quite different. Now, what I've, I've plotted here is not at all a complete network of any of these things. I've just picked an example that shows a, a particular kind of subset of these being different. So on the left here, and this is not plotted geographically, this is just plotted topologically. On the left here, uh, this is movements between areas in Glasgow, because that's where I live, um, movements between areas in greater Glasgow, if you consider people who I think are probably essential workers, so probably who were going to work during the first lockdown, uh, including infrastructure, uh, nurses, care professionals, this sort of thing. Um, uh, I, I tried to pick out essential retail. It was a little more challenging. But these are things where I think workers were likely going to work in the, in the first lockdown. Um, and it, it's kind of a mess. You can't see a whole lot, but there's, you know, there's kind of a bunch of complex things going on. You see barely that there are some nodes that have really a lot of connections but it's a bit spread out. On the other hand, on the right, this is uh, the same set of geographic places. Again, obviously plotted non-geographically, uh, but this is for people who work in offices. So who are probably not going to work during the first lockdown. And you can see that what really dominates this network is essentially there's one or two tiny areas in Glasgow where the vast majority uh, of people who work in large office towers go to work. I know where that is because I live right by it. <laughs> it's Glasgow city center. And so, my point is, regardless of how important you think it is or not, if we're using a network that looks like the one on the right, when we should be using a network that looks like the one on the left, that's a problem, right? So we need to understand which kind of network is driving our disease so that we can use the right one if we're modeling it. Okay, um, I have some more examples of, of differing networks uh, that, I, that I wanna highlight. This one um, has been provided for me kindly by Anne-Sophie. So Anne-Sophie is a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and I've been collaborating with her, um, by which I mean, for those of you who have grad students, essentially, I do nothing except have opinions, and she does all of the work um, on, uh, on networks of the Scottish islands, particularly the, the islands in the west of Scotland, which is what this is a map of. Um, now, you would think the connections between islands in the west of Scotland would be quite simple, because uh, there just aren't that many ways to get between them, right? People aren't teleporting, they're getting ferries or bridges or something. But when we compare our different data sets, uh, we see that the ferry data that describes uh, the, the CalMac ferry routes and the travel to work data is actually surprisingly different. <laughs> so she's plotted here uh, in yellow, the places that have um, a lot of people or at least some people moving in both this census travel to work data and this ferry data. And that's the majority of things. But on the other hand, there are also quite a few places that are only present in the census data, which means there's somebody, say, from Isla reporting that they work on Butte. There's no direct ferry connection from Isla to Butte. Um, 
but nevertheless, there are people who say that they're working one to the other. And then there are a couple of places, like this red one between Bear and Tyree, that is in the ferry data, but there's no one who reports that they live in one of these places and work in the other. So it, my, my point is, is that if we naively took one of these data sets and not the other, we would probably be getting it a little bit wrong. Um, and, and it matters which of these we're using. Okay, so um, just to provide in words a couple even more confounding differences, I mentioned that these workers can be different. Geographic adjacencies are again different. So it's certainly the case that especially essential workers uh, are, are more likely to work near where they live. So they capture some of that geographic kernel, but not all of it. If I just thought that COVID were instead spreading geographically from area to area, instead of by people driving to work, it may be more important to do the geographic network rather than some sort of travel to work network. School catchments are again different and are really <laughs> a challenge to deal with. I've had a lot of difficulty um, helped by uh, helped by especially people in um, Professor Roland Kao's group at Edinburgh on, in dealing with school catchments. Student movements, by which I mean university students, have been another bugbear getting hold of those and, and trying to make a network of movement um, at the beginning of semester and at the end of semester. And then there are kind of more bespoke things. What about linkages via care home company? What about um, tourist movements versus work movements? There are just a million of them. Um, and how to figure out which one we should use for what time scale and what evidence we have that we should be using it is, is a real challenge. So one thing that we can do to try and tease this out uh, is look for clustering of infection in these networks. Oh, sorry, please go away, bottom of my screen thing. No, okay, that's fine. You can't stop us. Um, so I really would prefer that you went away though. That's all right. Uh, so we, we can look for clustering in these networks. If a disease clusters enormously in a network, then, then that's reasonable evidence that that network might be carrying that disease, right? Okay, so there are a couple of ways to do this that I want to talk about. One of them is, is not a very good way, and, and that's one that I've been using. And then I want to talk ab about a slightly better way that somebody else has been using. So one really simple way to do it, to assess whether your disease is clustering uh, in your network, if you are not a statistician, I understand that there are many um, very useful uh, spatial statistics methods to, to do this, which I've been learning increasingly about in the last couple of days. But the, the sort of back of the envelope simple thing that I'd been doing before was to look at my network um, and count how many connections were within a group of people who, or a group of nodes that were infected and how many were outside. So let me take you through this example that I've drawn. I have a couple of these hand-drawn things in this talk because I really miss working on a whiteboard. So here I have my network drawn out Black nodes, black lines. Okay, there we go. There's one network on the left and one network on the right on the same set of nodes, but different sets of edges. So what I do when I'm looking on this network on the left, my red nodes circled in red. So these three on the bottom, those are the three diseased nodes, right? Those are my three areas that have a lot of COVID or farms that have tuberculosis or whatever. So I count up the number of connections that are between things that are disease. So here I have two, two within edge, uh, with, within red edges. I count up the things that are at the border. So between something that is infected and something that isn't. I've tried to draw these. This was supposed to be a rainbow pen to indicate it was between two different colors. It hasn't, hasn't quite come out as rainbow as I would like, but we could all use a little bit of sparkle, I think. Um, so we count those up uh, and then we count up the number that, that are just non-infected places. What this really meant getting at is the idea that if my network has, say, uh, an enormously uh, important edge between, let's, uh, let's say, Glasgow City and those two, if I had for ages and ages and ages a lot of disease in Glasgow City Centre and it never spilled into the West End, well, then what that's probably probably telling you is that that kind of network that's describing that movement in which we say, oh yeah, Glasgow city center, Glasgow West End, totally paired, totally going back and forth all the time. If we continue to see no disease over that edge, probably we're using the wrong edges. Yeah. So that's what this counting is about. Okay. So I have this network over here on the left where I've done this counting up. And then I have one on the right, which has a different set of edges and I do my counting up. And if I kind of look at these two, I say, well, of all my edges, 
this one on the right has more within infection edges and fewer to the outside. And that probably means this one on the right explains my, explains my disease better. So I should probably be using this one on the right. I've done this very informally, but what you would do really is count these up and compare either between networks or compare it to some null model, right? Where you have a random model of distribution of disease and you compare the counts of within versus between to that. Okay, so that's kind of the way that I was as an, a, an ignorant person doing it when I needed to do it one day. Uh, a slightly better way that, uh, that I've been done is being done by, this is Ewan Coleman. He's also at the University of Edinburgh and also in Roland Kao's group. Uh, this is where he tweets, if you wanna follow him, he talks uh, good sense about disease stuff quite often. Um, and what he was doing was a, a little bit more principled, similar in flavor, uh, but a little bit more rigorous. And so there, uh, what he did is he made this idea of, of, of a map. So we have here our regions, let's call them intermediate zones for here for now, intermediate zones, uh, and draw the Voronoi cells around them. This is mostly just for, for illustration here. So let's say this region here is for this intermediate zone centroid. So you take your, uh, your place that has some has some infection and then look at how infected the places in a kind of ring of some particular distance are away and if for an infected place in the middle here um, all of the other intermediate zones within some ring of distance excuse me are infected that kind of suggests clustering and you can compare that to a network where instead of having these connections only to things some sort of donut distance away you just randomly rewire them. You can compare those two and get some notion of, uh, of the statistical significance of this clustering in the ring that, uh, that he found. And using this analysis, without going into too many details, because I, I know he's still working on it uh, and, and keen to get it published and out in the world, um, Ewan found that, uh, at least in the first wave in Scotland, when we kind of had enough cases that it wasn't nowhere, but not so many that it was everywhere, Cases were correlated kind of all the way up from uh, very local up to a distance of 20 or 30 kilometers. One of the reasons that's important um, is that it helps you uh, understand and think about what is the right scale for a local lockdown, right? Like if infection tends to cluster over 100 kilometers, then deploying your, your interventions at 20 kilometers is of no use. But on the other hand, if infection clusters at five kilometer distance, then imposing it on 30 kilometers, well, that's too broad. So, so this can help give you an idea of that. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed that approach and I'm, I'm glad I could, could put it up here. So thanks to, thanks to you and for letting me, letting me share that. And as always, I meant to say at the beginning, I'm talking about a lot of other people's work here tonight. Uh, and I wanted to put a blanket apology for anything I get wrong. Anything I get wrong is my fault. Anything that's good is, is their work. Okay. Right. One thing I want to draw your attention to, though, is that even if you're doing this in a sensible way, there are many complicating situations. And one complication I've come across in the last couple days is a network that is right most of the time, but is wrong in a very few very important cases. And I'm going to show you an example of one of these cases. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can, so you can see it. There we go. So let me describe to you what I've plotted here. Please forgive the placement of the legend. I essentially just didn't bother moving it because I had a lot of things to do. But let me tell you what you should be seeing here. There's some gray lines. They start down at the bottom. They go up quite sharply up to the inside of this legend, and then they go back down. There are some other lines that mostly just jig along together. That's what I want you to really see here. Now I'll tell you what these lines are. <laughs> For um, an MSOA is an area in England that has like a couple thousand people, let's say, I don't know, five, well, it varies a lot, actually. It goes from about 5,000 to, I think there's a, there's a MSOA that has like 15,000 people in it, which is enormous, but they're kind of on that order, right? Like, you know, five through 10,000 is, is about a normal size for an MSOA. So what I've done is for Birmingham in this picture, though I've done it for essentially all of the other local authorities, um, for Birmingham, I've picked out the MSOAs that I think have a high concentration of university students. Now, how have I determined that? It's a little complicated. It uses census data is the essential version. Um, so I've picked out the MSOAs that have a lot of university students in them within Birmingham. Then I have counted up the number of people who've tested positive for COVID in that MSOA and divided that by the population of that MSOA 
Then I've taken the mean of all of those and plotted that. The solid lines are means, the dotted lines are medians. That's just to give you an idea of variance in case, in case you're worried about that. But essentially what we see here is exactly what was reported in the news. And I've just picked on Birmingham because of this particular venue, but we see this in, in essentially most university towns. So there's, there's nothing special really about, about the fact that it's Birmingham. We go along and then we have students return and the areas with a high concentration of students see an enormous and rapid increase in the number of test positives. Uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and then kind of, I must admit to my surprise, we see also a fairly rapid decline um, over the next several weeks. So week 36 through 44 is sort of September through early November kind of idea. Um, I guess mid late September through through early end of October, early November, but it's the period over which students returned is, is my point. So I've plotted that. And then I've also, I've picked out the places that do not themselves have a high concentration of students, but are either near places that do have a high concentration of students or just have fewer students, but are in Birmingham or are in Birmingham, don't have many students and are explicitly farther away from places that have a lot of students. And all I want you to observe about those lines is that they're basically the same, the yellow, green, and blue. So. What do I want you to, to see from this? And what is my point? My point is this, usually for COVID-19, the geographic network is a pretty good network. We see clustering at, at local geographic levels. You see spread from neighborhood to neighborhood when they're nearby each other. But on the other hand, if I look at the places that are really near student areas, even though those student areas have tended to have these big outbreaks, I don't tend to see following big outbreaks in the places the places around them. So my, my overall point is that in this case, I had a network that is right most of the time, but in this extremely important case, and the reason it's very important is that we have seen such big student outbreaks, it doesn't seem to apply. Being beside a student area doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, well, I, this isn't evidence that it makes a difference anyway. Um, well, if you were over the, you know, if you in the first wave were near an area that had a very big outbreak, you were much more likely to have a big outbreak. That's not the case here. So it, it was kind of a cautionary note um, that we can be right most of the time, but very wrong in very important cases, and that can cause a big problem. Okay, let's let's continue on. So apart from that clustering, I wanted to highlight some work that I really think will help us understand much more clearly. <laughs> um, what's going on and what networks are important. And again, this is work that I have very little, in fact, really nothing to do with, done by a really impressive consortium of people, in this case in Scotland, but it's being done for the UK as a whole. Uh, and without going into too much technical detail, because I definitely don't want to get into the biology of it, the idea here is that we take uh, sequences from the pathogen and use them to construct uh, sort of transmission trees of where we think infection has gone from where to where. And this can let you try and reconstruct the network of likely transmission uh, amongst different areas. So this is a snapshot of likely transmission uh, within Scotland based on the genetics of the virus over the first wave. So I'm just going to move this presentation aside slightly because I really want to show you the web page that I took this from in case it's of interest. Because uh, I think this is really great work, and I want to I want to highlight it. So here we go. Here is this massive and impressive consortium that's been working on this. Hopefully, you can you can still see the screen, and you now see a web page. Somebody make a really sad face if that's not the yeah. Okay, nobody's nobody's looking really angry. So uh, this is this is the project for the Scottish data, and what they've managed to do using these sequences. So if you enjoy the sort of thing, you can view sequences. But of much more interest to me uh, are pieces of information on, for example, imports, right? So we can, they can conjecture, I think fairly robustly, about where different imports to Scotland in this case, though I've, I've seen the work done elsewhere, um, Quebec, the UK as a whole, lots of places. Uh, this can let us kind of essentially know almost for sure uh, where, the, where the pathogen has come from in lots of different cases. And they've used this to essentially make a film of what, what they've found um, to be the most likely spread of the disease in Scotland from health board to health board. So this is a quite a coarse geographic area, but you can see they've, you know, they've kind of done from early epidemic 
these arrows going back and forth. You can see we're in the summer. There's a lot of transfer to and from England and very little yeah, within. And now we're, we're getting back into epidemic time in the autumn. And, and here we have a lot of transmission between the health boards. Anyway, I wanted to show you this because I think, I mean, this clustering stuff that we were doing essentially is guessing really at, at, what, at what's most likely uh, which network and which edges to have spread the disease. Whereas I think data is king here. If you can have actual data that tells you which network you should be using, I think that's great. And I want to highlight the potential of, of this particular work to show us things not just about region to region, but also population to population. So it's a huge open question. We had this big rise in prevalence in younger people. How much of that spills over into older people um, where we know things are more dangerous? Uh, once we have that spillover, is it circulating in those respective places or are we having repeated back and forth? That's really important um, in, in terms of uh, understanding how to how to protect people. So I, I'm really excited to, to see more outputs from from this work. Okay. So I think I've tried to convince you that it's important to know what the network is, uh, and that we have some ways where we can try and at least take a crack at figuring out what the network is. So once we know what it is, there are some questions we would like to answer who's most important is one of them. This comes up all the time in people working with these networks. If you had a choice about which individuals in this network you were going to vaccinate or test for surveillance or something like that, who would you pick? You wouldn't pick any of these small vertices that have few connections. Obviously, you would pick these big vertices that have lots of connections, right? And figuring out who is most important is kind of complicated because, well, that's the obvious answer. Pick things that have high degree a degree is the, is the word for uh, how many uh, nodes they're connected to. There are things that are a little bit more subtle. So like, for example, uh, let's look down here, kind of on the left-hand side. These two vertices here, even though they themselves are small, in this network, they, they do look like they play a kind of important role, right? Like if you somehow removed these two or protected them, it would separate the entire left side, which admittedly is not very large, but kind of large enough from the right side. So you can have this notion of importance that is uh, just how many things you could infect. You can also have this notion of importance that is how important you are for flow over the whole network. Um, these, uh, these kind of end up as lots of different notions of what we call centrality. Now this picture I have stolen from Wikipedia um, and it just is the same network exactly, but with four different definitions of centrality. I can't remember what order they're in, but one of them is just how many things you're connected to. One of them is sort of how many shortest paths you're on, so how between things you are. Um, the point I'm making here is that if you choose a different centrality measure, you get a different important vertex. So you need to think really carefully about it. All right. So um, one of the things that people like to do is to try and think about if we have a network, how we modify it to make it safer. And of course, how we do this just depends enormously on what we can change and how the disease operates. So if we have the power to limit trade or between region contact with travel shutdowns, we can modify the edges essentially. If we can make rules about timing, we can change the times on edges that can make a really surprising difference, but is really hard to enforce with humans. Um, if you can protect vertices from infection, we can remove them essentially. So that's like vaccination or, or something like that. Uh, for any computational complexity enthusiasts, essentially all of these problems are NP hard, which will not surprise you at all. Um, but, uh, but I thought I'd mention that. So one common thing to do is to uh, look at removing nodes or edges that you judge to be important by one of these centrality measures. So either I'm between a lot of things, uh, I, uh, I myself am directly connected to a lot of things. So you simulate removing those and simulate a disease on the network. So I've shown one example of this here, uh, another paper I had nothing to do with, um, <clears throat> but it's a really common approach in, in epidemiology papers. You take your network, you remove either in black a random node, <laughs> uh, you remove uh, some nodes or vertices that, uh, sorry, nodes or edges that you think are important by some measure, and then you see how quickly you get a reduction in expected uh, uh, disease prevalence. So in almost all networks, you can do better than random. Random just kind of slowly decreases uh, the prevalence as you protect people or edges. Whereas if you choose them strategically, it, it cuts off much faster. 
So that's one thing you can do. Um, so then the question is, if we were looking at this network, how would we target surveillance testing, right? I actually spent a long time staring at this today, trying to figure it out. It's not a fantastically drawn network, which didn't help me. <laughs> but I think, you know, you try and pick out some of these ones that are both relatively high degree and are kind of bridges across the network. Um, we've been looking at simulating doing this in university student populations. So if, if you had a limited surveillance budget, surveillance sounds so ominous. I just mean screening testing, asymptomatic screening testing. Who do you, who do you screen? Um, and it's probably people who have a lot of contacts. They'll make a bigger difference. Um, and in, in university cases, this is looking increasingly like it's first year students. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, to mention that. Okay, so I'm, I'm running short of time. Uh, I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about uh, things about networks that have uh, confused me and other people before, um, because, uh, because I think they're interesting. So the first thing is probably the most obvious thing, uh, and that's the importance of heterogeneity and the reproductive number. Um, <clears throat> so I must say, I never really expected to never have to explain what a reproductive number is again, but I think after this year, it's, I'm going to have to, you know, I'll, I'll be like the FMD person. About 20 years from now, I will fail to uh, say what a reproductive number is, and my students will be like, what are you talking about? But everyone who has lived through this will remember what an R number is. The point I want to make is that we talk about uh, reproductive numbers in networks. In my opinion, it doesn't make a ton of sense, right? We have so much heterogeneity, right? So I've, I've drawn you two trees describing uh, propagation in a network. This figure on the left is, will be very um, familiar to you from, well, if you're in Scotland, the ads from Scottish government showing figures like this have been everywhere for months and months. But essentially here we have each person infecting four further people. The dots are people, the lines are infections, four infections per person, reproductive number four. Easy peasy, excellent best calculation ever. In this one on the right, which is probably actually more like what we get with COVID and lots of other diseases, if I've drawn the right number of dots here, and I think I have, then this is also four infections per person. But man, what a difference, right? Here, if we randomly remove people, we might make a pretty big difference. On the right, if we randomly remove people, yeah, we'd have to get lucky and hit this guy. Otherwise, it's going to make no difference at all. So talking about a reproductive number, I find much harder in a network. And there are appropriate concepts defined um, often in terms of the uh, a matrix describing adjacency for the network, but it's just a harder concept in networks. And part of the reason for that is that reproductive numbers have really been defined with the idea of being a threshold. If your reproductive number is above one, you get a big outbreak. You get an exponentially growing epidemic. If your reproductive number is below one, you don't get it, right? In a network, it's a little more complicated. It's a little more high variance. I've drawn this little example that I'll, 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 uh, I'll take you through really quickly. I, I got bored drawing networks, I must admit, sorry. So here we have two networks drawn as blobs, right? Um, this one on the left, my, I've colored in all a uniform vague shade of blue. The idea is that the network is about medium density everywhere. It's very similar everywhere. <clears throat> okay. And if you look at a simulated disease on this network, so we've just the y axis on these tiny little charts is disease and the x axis is time. So this is just an epidemic curve if you looked at lots of those. You pretty much get a lot of fairly consistent, goes up quickly, levels off epidemic curves. That's not my smoothest epidemic curve ever, ever forgive me, but it kind of goes up. In most simulations that we start, we'll get something that looks like that on this network. So we kind of understand what it would mean for an epidemic threshold to exist. Is this network dense enough kind of everywhere so that we do get an epidemic curve? Fine. But on the right, <laughs> it looks more like what we real networks look like. And, and here we have this sort of green background, which is sparse, very few connections for lots of our network. And then these little horrible red areas of high, high density. And what we get if we simulate a lot of network uh, disease outbreaks on this network is really either this red curve, which is like, Wah! you know, a great big outbreak really quickly. Or if it starts somewhere in the green region, we just get nothing. So <sighs> there's still the notion of an epidemic threshold but even if you have a really high epidemic threshold, you might get lucky a lot of the time and get nothing. Or if it's low, you might still end up on a, on a, on a red bit and get something. So it, it's just a harder notion to talk about. Now, the very last thing that I, I wanna say, 
um, and I promise this, this is the last thing because I, I, I know we're basically out of time, is that <clears throat> networks change over time. Sometimes they change over time predictably, like the cattle network, it has seasonality. Um, and spring is more similar to spring. Winter is more similar to winter, winter. But even then, we have to be careful to use the right network for the right time of year. Sometimes networks change abruptly over time. <laughs> and in the middle of a pandemic is one of those times. You've probably seen pictures like this where it shows essentially retail activities in cities at kind of normal levels up to the end of March, and then it falls off a cliff at the end of March and then kind of gradually increases towards the summer. We see this in retail activity, in workplace activity. Um, this is a plot of ferry passengers in the Scottish islands, again, kindly provided by Anne Sophie. Um, and the orange line is sort of normal passenger movement in the summer on ferries. But this year, nothing, <laughs> right? My point here is that networks sometimes are dynamic in predictable ways. And it's important to include that in your model if you can. Sometimes networks are, <laughs> are dynamic in wildly unpredictable ways. And then what do you do? You just as cautiously as you can. In an emergency, sometimes you can't be as cautious as you would like. Uh, and then you just talk about all of the caveats and warnings associated with the use of the network. Um, that one has definitely caught me out several times in the last couple of months. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop talking there. Um, this section in my in my tech code for this talk is literally called Stop Talking, Jess. Um, I'll, I'll thank all of you, but also uh, many more thanks uh, to the collaborators. I've inevitably failed to mention some of them, but I wanted to especially highlight uh, the Scottish COVID Response Consortium, uh, Professor Kao's group, uh, VCHEMS, which is the Virtual Knowledge Exchange in Mathematics group. Um, I, if I don't get to a question that you have, I'm pretty friendly, I'm happy to chat. Uh, this is where you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, and email. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you.